Hello, I'm Deepak Bhatt from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, here for day three of ESC 2020, covering for ACC.org with two good buddies of mine, Dr. Kim Eagle, our editor-in-chief for ACC.org from the University of Michigan in good old Ann Arbor, and Dr. Gabriel Steg from the University of Paris and Hôpital Bichat. So we've got a number of trials to cover. You know, I should probably tell the ACC.org audience every now and then I get an email, sometimes an angry email, but why didn't you cover this trial or why didn't you cover that trial? We try to cover everything that we think is potentially scientifically interesting and or practice changing, but a big caveat is you've got to send us your slides and uh, we're pre-taping these before the actual uh, presentation. So if you don't send us your stuff, there's no way we can actually cover your great trial. So uh, we're gonna cover two things that we think are super interesting and to their credit, the investigators actually under embargo sent us their slides. So let's start off with home PE, Kim. Uh, you've given a lot of thought to risk stratification through the years, of course, did all that seminal work on, on surgical risk stratification. Uh, what is home PE? What's it testing and what does it mean to us? Yeah, this is a really nice trial. It's a, it's a large study of uh, almost 2,000 patients. Uh, the investigators did an interesting study design. They really, one of the questions they wanted to ask is, is what, what type of scoring system is best for uh, risk stratifying a patient with PE? And they compared something called the Hestia rule uh, to the PESI score, which is currently endorsed by the ESC. Uh, and, and these rules have slightly different um, factors in them, but they factor into things like age, hemodynamic status, heart rate, uh, PO2, things like that. Um, and in low-risk patients, uh, the question was, if you had a zero score on the Hestia rule or the PESI score, was it safe to go home with home management of your PE? So these were lower-risk patients, uh, and they were anticoagulated effectively at home and then followed up uh, a number of months later. Uh, and very good news, the, the, as you would expect in compliant patients, taking anticoagulants at home if you're low risk uh, is safe. Uh, it looked like uh, as many as a third of patients could go home from the emergency department. The, the number of deaths was almost nil. The number of recurrent VTE events was almost nil. Uh, the two scores I think compared relatively similarly and I, I, I don't think one is heavily favored over the other. But I, I interpret the trial uh, as an important one because it, it suggests to me, at least my patients with stable PE who don't have these risk factors like malignancy, for example, can probably go home and be treated there. Yeah, no, that's a great summary. And uh, I, I guess you're right, both risk scores seem to perform well, though I'm waiting for the Eagle PE score, but, <laughs> but these two did look pretty good. Uh, I guess I might be living in the 20th century still. I mean, I've not sent PEs home yet. Uh, maybe if it's an incidentally discovered thing on a, you know, a staging CT or something and somebody that's totally asymptomatic, uh, normal pulse ox, normal blood pressure. But when someone that's come in symptomatically, I, I, I've not yet done that, you know, uh, but, but maybe I should based on this trial after using one of these risk scores. Gabriel, what are you all doing in France? And uh, is this trial gonna change what you're doing? assuming you're not already doing this. Yeah, so this is, this is actually a French-based trial uh, though done by uh, a network of French investigators called Innovate. Uh, but they, um, uh, you know, there are parts of the world in Europe, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the UK and, and Canada, where I know that uh, these uh, low-risk PEs are truly being sent home. I think there's tremendous variation in practice. I'm not exactly sure what the reason is. Yeah, Kim, why then aren't we doing this in the US? Or should we start? I think we should start. Uh, I think uh, in a society that is relatively litigious, the notion of taking an acute PE patient and sending them home where you can't verify effective therapy is scary. There may be a reverse correlation, the number of lawyers in a population to the likelihood of doing this. Um, but this, for me at least, is a trial that might change my practice. And I, I hope the audience will embrace it because it's a large study. It's very well done. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. It, it's uh, probably uh, a correlation there. Uh, though we can't say too many bad things about lawyers. There are definitely some good lawyers like Dr. Stegg's wife, for example. But, but <laughs> uh, it, Yeah, it, it, I, met, I met one the other day. 
<laughs> exactly. But uh, on that uh, cheery note, maybe we'll move on to the next slide here or, or the next series of uh, slides and, and uh, trial, the Ladoco trial. And uh, Gabriel, uh, maybe you can comment to us about this study of cultures here. On day one, the audience may recall, and if you didn't see it, you should see it our wrap up of the uh, Colcont updates and the COPS trial, which was a new colchicine trial. And now we've got Ladoco, a rather large study. Uh, Gabriel, do you want to tell the audience what it is and what we found or what they found? So a few years ago, our Australian colleagues uh, conducted a, a trial called Ladoco. It was a small trial, that found a dramatic benefit of colchicine in secondary prevention in patients with established cardiovascular disease. Last year, uh, the Colcott trial uh, found benefit of low-dose colchicine in patients post-MI. And LODOCO2 is a much larger attempt than LODOCO1 at exploring this. It's enrolling uh, more than 5,000 patients with stable coronary artery disease and to receive 0.5 milligrams of colchicine or matching placebo. And the, uh, the bottom line is that there was a a reduction of 31% uh, in a primary composite of CVDES, MI, stroke, or ischemia-driven revascularization. So that's quite compelling. There was a, also a benefit in a key secondary endpoint of uh, cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, so dropping the softer endpoint of revascularization. Um, however, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that uh, the incidence of death from non-cardiovascular causes was actually higher in the colchicine group than in the placebo group. The difference was modest, but there was borderline non-significant. And that is uh, notice, notable because a similar phenomenon was noted in the COPS trial and also in the COLCO trial. So this is not the first time we're seeing this. And I think it casts some uh, shadow on the non-cardiovascular effects of colchicine in these patients. Kim, what do you think about this particular trial and then the colchicine story and whether it is something we should or shouldn't use in practice now for the purposes of cardiovascular risk reduction? Well, I was really impressed by the, the cold cut early therapy analysis that was uh, presented at this meeting and the notion that early treatment might really affect inflammation of the muscle or the coronary, or the coronary itself in an acute MI. But it's disturbing, um, you know, if you see one trial with a slight uptick in non-cardiovascular death that, you know, a handful of patients, you, you can just sort of push that off to chance. But when you start seeing it in, in several trials, I, I think it really has to make you wonder if there is a cause and effect. Uh, and if the primary benefit of colchicine is on uh, revascularization and not MI or death from a cardiac cause, uh, then I'm a little more sanguine about how quickly I'm going to embrace this drug in my patients. So I'm disturbed by that signal uh, for sure. Yeah, really great comments. Um, I uh, will have to remain neutral uh, as I'm chairing the DSMB of the large ongoing clear synergy trial with colchicine that the group at McMaster in Canada is running. So, um, you know, I, I, I would say, let's see what that study shows. But uh, certainly a, a well done trial here that teaches a lot uh, about colchicine and perhaps uh, lessons that are useful as we develop, we, I mean, as a cardiovascular community and a research community, other anti-inflammatory approaches to cardiovascular risk reduction. Certainly, it looks like there's lots of promise for reducing important ischemic events, but some potential perhaps for off-target toxicity that we'll need to be mindful of. So uh, a lot of good science. Well, now hopefully for our audience uh, at home, uh, this has been useful coverage of ESC 2020. Uh, lots of good stuff here from day three as well. You can tune into day one and day two and uh, recaps that we did there. Also on acc.org, you can tune in for clinical trial summaries, journal scans, news stories, all sorts of great content as far as ESC 2020 coverage. Thank you so much, Kim and Gabriel, and thanks to our audience for watching. Mm -hmm.